Welcome everyone to part eight of the Lockbit anti-analysis series. Um, the previous videos now have, have kind of taken us through an in-depth discussion and analysis of how the runtime linking is performed and a lot of the different and, and you know and, and maybe somewhat minor tweaks that it that Lockbit has implemented in order to accomplish that. Um, the last video, for example, we finally got to the point where we saw the implementation of the trampolines and the impact that that has on our analysis. Now we're finally ready to navigate through the last couple of functions here and talk about some more direct anti-analysis. So um, the first function just comes after the last call to, uh, I, I might have renamed this since the last video, but you'll see that um, all of these functions, resolving imports with trampolines, um, this is where we left off in the last video, just looking at how it you know, kind of goes through each library that it needs and resolves function pointers uh, reobfuscates them and then you know creates these little trampolines to execute them. So we're done analyzing all that code. Now we have this call to sub 40B444 with an argument of zero. So if we navigate into that function, you'll see that there really isn't a whole lot here. Um, we don't know much about this argument at this point. So oftentimes I like to do things like this and just say, okay, I, I know it's a constant zero. I don't know what else it is, but um, if we analyze the function, you'll see that v1 is the first argument to this you know, now resolved or, or will be resolved when we step through this in our debugger function pointer. Um, it's the first argument. And so we can see that it either is equal to the argument if it's greater than zero. Otherwise, it's just going to have a hex value of ff, 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 fe. So what is this? Well, uh, for this analysis so far, usually at this point when I haven't you know, decided to commit to trying to resolve all of these function pointers globally and do this across my entire IDB, my, my IDA database, um, I'm just going to continue with the debugging. So I think what we'll do here because of, of how I want to walk through this, let's go ahead. We're going to set a breakpoint right here, 653A, that's the offset, and I'm going to use X64. That's what I've been using for... I think this entire series, um, our image base is E10000. Let me just confirm that. There it is. So I'm going to set that breakpoint. Um, it wouldn't hurt. Let's just go ahead and, and we're at the very beginning. So this is the initial break for the load of this executable. Um, now we're at our entry point. And so I'm going to set a breakpoint here after all this runtime linking at this knob. Uh, just in case I make a mistake, um, you know, at this point, we know that this is going to get into all the ransomware stuff. Uh, so we've got the breakpoint set. We've got our fallback set. Let's go ahead, resume execution. And there we go. We're at the push. So at, by the end of this video, I'm going to talk about some real simple ways to get past this. Mainly, we'll just knock out the instructions for now. Um, and that's why I want to set the breakpoint here, because we'll need to knock out not only the push, but the call. For now, though, we can go ahead. We can step into this function. And all we want to do is get to the call itself. Now, this is memory that was allocated in that new heap and represents that trampoline. So we step into the call. You'll see that there is the obfuscated function pointer. The technique that was used for this particular execution then was to move that into EAX, rotate it right by five bits, and now jump EAX. So it's the jump EAX value, um, or what's now in EAX, which represents the actual API. And you can see that that is out of NTDLL and it's CW set information thread. So knowing that, we can go online, a couple of resources here. Um, I usually like to start with Windows APIs with MSDN. Not everything's gonna be defined here, but I usually like to take a look at what Microsoft officially has to say if they have anything to say. And here you can see that it is in fact documented. The first argument is the thread handle. So it looks like it's going to be utilizing um, this technique in order to det essentially detach debuggers from itself. There are a couple of different, well, there's a number of different ways I think you can approach this. One, one is, of course, reading the documentation here, trying to figure out exactly what it is that the, the, you know, the malware authors are trying to accomplish. Um, oftentimes, I find a quicker way is to just search for the technique, search for the API, and you might uncover techniques. So this is a great blog. I've used it or talked about it in many videos, uh, but you'll see that the NT set information thread, which is the API that we're talking about here, is used to hide from a debugger. 
And it does this by setting the thread info class to a value of hex 11 or a base 10 value of 17. And so that I think is a little bit quicker to understand rather than going through all the documentation here and, and trying to piece it together that way. Of course, you're not always going to find great resources like this. So this is just, again, I come across a, an API that's being utilized. Maybe I don't recognize the technique. I just go to a search engine and search, you know, uh, maybe uh, set information thread anti-analysis or set information thread malware. And you might find a resource like this. Now, if we go back to our analysis, we can see that, okay, this would then be the handle. So we could update the argument here or this local variable. Um, and there is our hex 11, or if we go into base 10, value of 17. So now we know pretty sure it's going to detach. It's going to detach from the debugger. We might want to update the, you know, the call targets here as we go, just recognizing that this is going to be to the trampoline that eventually calls it. Not necessarily the most efficient or effective way, um, but when I'm, you know, early in the process of analyzing a, a binary, um, you know, I'm still trying to piece together what's going on here and then figuring out how to handle this anti-analysis is a part of that step. Uh, so, you know, this is a good way to just keep track of what's going on. Now, if we go back to the debugger, if we allow this to execute, and I'm not going to do this for the video, uh, but if you allow this jump to be taken and eventually this, this method, this function to be called, um, your debugger is going to stop receiving events. Basically, you're no longer going to be able to debug the malware and it's going to take off and run and you're going to get ransomed. So we do want to be able to, to handle, especially if we want our analysis to continue, we want to be able to handle this function. And so there's, I'm, there's dozens of ways you could probably come up with in order to do this. And so one technique is just to simply, you know, patch instructions in memory during debug. So I've already reset the session here and you can see now we're, we're back at that initial push. Um, we have to be a little careful here because if we just if we just knocked out and, and that's ultimately what I'm going to do, but if we if we knocked out the call, well that push would throw off our stack alignment. So we want to make sure to get all of the relevant instructions in the bytes. X32, X64, we just have to hit the space bar. That'll put us into the assembly mode, and then we can just say, okay, let's knock out the current instruction. So that's only going to handle one byte, but then we can check this box fill with knobs, and that'll get the rest of the bytes. So you can see this instruction, the push zero is a two byte instruction that I'll knock out both of those. There we go. Um, we can skip over. That's actually the next instruction, which is now a knop. And now we're to the call and we'll do the same with that. We'll say knop it out and fill with knops. And now that entire call is gone. And so now we can continue to step and we're not going to deal with the call to that first level of anti-analysis. Now, of course, you're probably thinking, um, well, that's not persistent, and it's not. Every time we start restart the debug session, then the code is back to the original, and we've got to deal with it. Uh, and we don't really, I certainly would not want to have to knock this out every single time. So I would be looking to go into IDA or whatever tool that you prefer, you know, prefer to do your binary patching and just patch it out in the actual underlying binary, make it persistent. And if you're not sure how to patch binaries, I already have a video in, in the channel here that talks about how you can do that with IDA. Um, so you'll be very, I think, be very easy for you to, to, to take a look at that and then apply that technique here with the binary. But essentially, you're just making sure that in the underlying binary itself, in the executable, you take the same bytes at these locations and knock them out so that you don't have to deal with that anti-analysis. Um, of course, in the next remaining videos here on the series, we're going to tackle the last bit of anti-analysis. So likely what you would ultimately want to do is just patch all of the remaining bytes and get rid of all of the anti-analysis. But uh, we'll maybe save that for a final video here. Um, that's it. One technique. I'm going to wrap this video up and we'll talk about the remainings here in the future videos. So hope to see you then.